it's so wonderful to have you here on the Clark Howard Show because I love what we're able to do together. I want to serve you. I want to empower you. Why? Because I want you to be in a position to take more control of financial decisions in your life. And there's a trend I want to talk about that you may want to consider if you're near or in retirement age, and that's going back to school. I know that's weird, but I want to tell you why it might be a neat thing to do. I'm also going to talk about something that used to be popular, then wasn't for a long time, and now there's a lot more buzz about it. It's renting to own a home. I want to tell you the opportunity and the hazards that that presents. So going back to college, late in life or at retirement, um, I have a friend who is going back to school, to grad school, very late in career, still working, but very late in career, and uh, is so excited about it and is getting a skill that will help her employer and benefit her. And it's neat because um, it's an opportunity to expand your mind. But I want to talk about what if you're past late career, you you were semi-retired or retired. In a lot of states, you can go to state schools for free or nearly free if you're past your 60th, 62nd, or 65th birthday. And it varies by state if they offer one of these programs. And keep your mind stimulated. You know, one of the most important things is to have interests, particularly when you're not going to work every day. The people who can't wait to retire and then think they're just going to play golf every day, that gets old really quickly. And so doing things that keep you active, that keep you thinking, whatever it is, and there are all these stories in medical research about how you can Uh, improve your mental acuity and stave off the possibility of uh, progressing dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever by keeping your mind extra, extra active. And whatever that is, learning a new skill, uh, going to college, it can be so many different kind of things, but that keep your mind going strong is really, really important. Sitting around sedentary as you age will make you age quicker. Just sitting there watching video content will do the opposite of stimulating your brain. You become a bit of a zombie sitting there consuming video content all day. So this is a trend that I'm excited about, you know, universities are all over this right now, coming up with whatever program they can to attract um, people who are late career or retirees because they're all short of students. And only in the state schools do they have the free or reduced rate tuition based on age. So you'll find a lot of traditional universities are making active efforts where in the past, They wouldn't have been interested in older students. Now they're like, yeah, let's have them. I've even seen some advertising now that's very heavily tilted towards mid-career people trying to get them back into the classroom to fill those empty seats. And we talked like two, three years ago about the dorm at the dorm type apartment they built at Arizona State University in Tempe for uh, senior citizens. And when my son and I were there visiting the flight school at Arizona State, we went by, just happened by that uh, senior citizens dorm kind of facility. And it's, it's really interesting because the, 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 uh, they're kind of like, they're a little more private than dorms, but the idea is proximity, that 
these people become students at the university. And it's kind of fun to see that. You've talked from time to time, Krista, about going your mid-career, going back and getting some kind of advanced mm-hmm. degree. But that ship has sailed for you right now? You're not doing that? Uh, no, I'm definitely, I always think about it. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But I'm, uh, I mean, the thing I've thought about really is I'd like to do volunteer work at some point. Um, helping people like with mental health issues. And so I've thought getting a master's in counseling would enable me to do more of that one day um, and actually have an impact instead of just volunteering. Um, so who knows? I'm looking into programs. Um, so so this may happen. One I'm, day you're going to come in and say, by the way, I'm now a student again. It could happen. So could think happen about soon. all the discounts you'll get with your student ID. Well, it would have to be very, very, very part-time because I'm super happy with my job and want to keep this job forever. Um, let's go to some questions. This one's from Anna in Georgia. She says, is FlexCar a good deal? So what is FlexCar? It is something that is happening around the country, different efforts. The biggest is by Sixt Car Rental, where S-I-X-T, which is a European-owned car rental company that's been growing in the United States, where you basically have a car subscription and you pay a flat rate per month and it allows you to have, um, have a fleet of vehicles available to you depending on the program you pay a, um, a fee to enter the program. Then you pay a monthly fee based on what class of vehicle you're interested in, from a subcompact on up to luxury vehicles, everything in between. The most popular vehicle typically in these programs is a smaller midsize SUV. But one of the pitches of these things is, let's say, one weekend you need a pickup truck. And then the next week, you need an over-the-road vehicle. And the next week, you'd like to drive a sports car. Um, That was the initial pitch. And the labor-intensive nature of that led to changes in these programs. And they tend to be a little more sedate now where you're paying by the month. My uh, oldest brother, Gary, and his wife, who are still nomads, uh, seven years, eight years in, they sold their home. And they just live in uh, shorter-term rentals or they live in hotels or whatever. Um, They have been regular users of the sixth program where they rent a vehicle a month at a time. And FlexCar is that same kind of idea. And it is, um, for the right person, this is a very viable way for you to have transportation. Dean in Wisconsin says, in a follow-up to T-Mobile and paying your bill, I will. All, I want to mention that I pay my bill with Apple Pay, and because I use my Apple Card, I get 3% back. I just thought I'd add that to your recent newsletter article. And a lot of people are still missed kind of what you talked about with T-Mobile. They're, st- they're just realizing now they're writing in about this, that they were paying with credit card, and now they're not getting their discount. So I think what T-Mobile did was something that was a complete violation of the spirit of the agreement they made with the federal government in order to buy Sprint. There were worries that the marketplace would lose price competitiveness going from four national players to three. And T-Mobile, in order to be able to acquire, had to agree to fix the price of their plans at the time of the acquisition for I forget how many years, and they're doing so many different things to try to push rates up, including now saying that if you pay by credit card, you pay a much higher fee per month for your service than if you pay by check or direct debit or something like that. I feel that violated the purpose and spirit of the agreement because it is a clear, not even hidden, price increase. And I think it was an unethical, dishonest move by T-Mobile. 
Auntie Gladdy in Rhode Island says, my nephew, who is 23, just passed his exam and is now a doctor of physical therapy. Congratulations. He knows I'm a huge fan of yours because I always preach the Clark way. He was so tired of me hounding him about signing up for a Roth IRA. He finally did it at age 20. (laughs) He is now asking me to help him sign up for his first credit card. He is looking to build his credit and he's extremely responsible. He was offered a full-time position on Long Island where his girl friend is finishing up her veterinarian degree. You always talk about establishing credit for those who have hit a rough patch, but what about for new grads who are just establishing their credit? What would you recommend for them? So uh, what I would say depends on, uh, well, let's think about this. Girlfriend. See, if it was his wife, I have an easy answer. Because she's still in veterinary medicine school, she can get a credit card really easily and get him an authorized user card. But uh, for a girlfriend to do that, don't know their relationship, it would be risky for her because she'd be extending credit to him. And, well, who knows uh, what the long term is. You may know that. That would be the best way for him to establish credit. If she gets a card, which is very easy for her being in professional school, and then adds him as an authorized user, then he's going to have instant solid credit with his work status. He's then able to apply for his own card. That would be the simplest path and easiest path for him to establish credit and be able to get his own cards. Next best thing would be for him to see if he can get a PETAL card, P-E-T-A-L card. It's a Visa card that uses non-traditional methods to establish someone being credit worthy uh, without using a traditional credit score and traditional credit history. So that would be my second. Third would be going to a credit union and joining a credit union and using their Fresh Start program, which is for people who either have had Uh, bad history with credit or have never had credit, the credit union programs are typically the best in the marketplace other than PEDAL. So try those things. The most important thing, it doesn't have to pay an annual fee, most important thing is while someone is enrolled in college full-time, that's when you apply for a card because they don't require evidence of income typically for you to be able to get your first card because college enrolled people are generally the least risky borrowers of all for credit card companies. Coming up ahead, speaking of borrowing, speaking of buying, how about starting renting a home in order to be able to borrow to buy that home later? We're going to talk about the opportunities and the hazards of doing that straight ahead. This is a very difficult time for people to buy a home. And we've covered so many different angles on that over the months. And you just think about, we had this big run up in home prices from 2012 to recently where home prices have leveled off in most of the country. And then we have interest rates that have gone from historical lows to more normalized rates. Uh, If you look historically, today's around 7% uh, for many, many years would have been an unbelievably low rate. So today, you've got the much higher home price and what by recent history is a huge increase in interest rates from where we were in the twos and threes and then the fours and then we jumped all the way to the sevens like felt like seemingly overnight so being a home buyer right now is very hard for a first time home buyer uh, for some people it's been impossible so there's something that comes in cycles and right now the big solicitation of people who are frustrated in the home buying market is rent with the option to own. And rent to own has been 
something that has been a successful path to home ownership for some people, but for most people, it just flat out hasn't worked out. The basics of how it works is you rent in a contract that generally gives you a time period to exercise an option to purchase. And that point may be two, three years later, most commonly. And by then, you have to, if your credit needs a little work, whatever, you have to be in a position by the end of that time period to have qualified for a mortgage and be able to exercise successfully your option to buy the home. It's not a free lunch. What happens is you pay an above market rent and a certain amount of that rent over that two or three year typical period goes into a down payment fund if you exercise your option. If you're unable to exercise your option, the the people peddling the rent to own to you keep it. So it's it's a not free ride at all because let's say the market rent just for keeping the numbers simple say the market rent is 1500 well you may have to pay 2000 a month with 1500 going to market uh, what would be considered to be market price rent 500 every month going into a down payment fund so that the idea is in three years you now have enough down payment money to be able to secure a mortgage and buy the property. You walk away, they keep your, in my example, your $18,000. You buy the home, the $18,000 becomes your down payment, and then your mortgage handles the rest. Why does this not work for so many people? One, you got to be honest and realistic with yourself. You only want to enter a rent to own if you feel like it's a neighborhood you want to live in, it's a house you want to live in, and it's realistic that you will be able in that time period of the option to be able to make the deal happen and buy that home. Because otherwise, any of those three doesn't happen, then it's just cost you time and money to do the rent to own. Also, you got to be careful with the rent to own contracts. There have been, I think, there were even hearings in on, in Congress about dishonest rent to own contracts, and you've got to be very, very cautious. And I recommend something that you may say you're wanting me to spend more money. Yes to have the contract reviewed before you sign it by a real estate lawyer. You want uh, that lawyer to let you know if that contract has uh, problems in it or if it is fair to you as well as being advantageous for whoever owns that home and is marketing it to you as a rent-to-home opportunity, rent-to-buy opportunity of a home. So be aware, know there could be minefields in that contract, and that's why you go see the real estate lawyer. Should be like um, less than an hour, but you'd be billed a minimum time for a lawyer to go through the contract and tell you if there are minefields in it. Krista? All right. This first question is from Ralph in Georgia. I was on a trip to Switzerland and I had a rental car. Upon returning home, I received a letter for speeding nine kilometers per hour over the speed limit of 80 kilometers per hour. Wait, 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 wait. Nine kilometers, so five and a half miles over the speed limit. You mm-hmm. got it. He got a ticket. Right. And what was the posted speed limit? 80 kilometers per hour. So a 50 mile per hour zone. <laughs> for this offense i was given a fine of 100 swiss francs which is equivalent to 114 dollars. no evidence was provided subsequent to my speeding letter i received a letter from the rental company telling me that they will be charging me 50 swiss francs for the administrative effort 
to provide my mailing address to the police. The letter claims that this is per the terms of the rental agreement. Talking to a friend, she told me that she had recently rented a car and been charged a $50 administrative fee for the rental car company to provide toll roll authorities for her her mailing address. I hope there's some way you can bring awareness and raise a stink about this fee that rental car companies are charging. Yeah, this same thing happens in the United States now, too. We frequently hear from people with the uh, toll by plate that later you'll get a big fee from the car rental agency, usually uh, the worst we've heard is from renters in Florida who are being charged $25 administrative fees for going through, let's say, a $2 toll in uh, typically the Orlando area. And many times if there's a toll by plate, you can call, if you know you're going through a toll area, you can contact either the website or call put in the, the tag number, plate number, and pay the toll. In Europe, I don't know how you would do that, but in the United States, you can usually do that. Um, my uh, brother, who I talk about a lot for being a nomad, continually gets these uh, toll-by-plate things, and he just has to call within five days in most jurisdictions you contact the toll authority where it is, you pay them directly, and then the bill does not go to the car rental agency that then bills you all their add-on junk fees. And the tickets in Europe, I, I was recently in Eastern Europe, and I came around a curve, and there was a speed limit sign, and then it took a picture of <laughs> my plate And I know that what happened to you is going to happen to me. And at some point, I'm going to get like a $50 junk fee equivalent plus the cost of the camera ticket that is coming. And it's just part of the joys of renting a car, not just in the United States, but overseas as well. Amy in Wisconsin says, my dad added me as an authorized user to his credit card when I was 21 as an emergency option when I traveled through Europe. I'm now so this is the Europe theme. Yeah. I'm now 35 and I have a credit score of 805, partially because I'm still listed as an authorized user on my dad's credit card. And that card is my longest history of credit. You talk a lot about adding people as authorized users, as you did earlier, but not about ending the authorized user status. Is there a reason that he would need to end my status at some point now that I have my own credit history? And if so, what's the best way to end my authorized user status to avoid having it impact my credit significantly? So, Amy, what's in it for uh, for each of you? So, uh, if your dad ever started having trouble with credit, that would reflect on you. You're not responsible for the credit, but it would reflect on your credit standing just as it's helped you build credit and you now have this uh, golden credit score of 805. Uh, That is an issue. Two, I'm gathering he didn't give you the actual plastic but made you an authorized user. You now, uh, almost 15 years later, you probably have enough variety of credit and all that the long-term credit history from that stays with you. It doesn't age anymore, but it still stays there. And so as long as you've got a variety of credit cards and various types of credit, it's fine for the authorized user status to end. It can be ended by either your dad or by you notifying the credit card company and say you no longer wish to be an authorized user Either way, with most issuers, either of you can do that. So uh, the risk to him is nothing if he's giving you, not giving you the plastic. The risk to you is only in the event that his credit goes bad at some point. Uh, so there may or may not be a priority for removing this, but as long as you over these nearly 15 years have established your own solid credit of various types, it's fine for you. To be removed and it's great that he did this for you because it gave you such a head start 
Tayo in Missouri says, I recently read that making a personal corporation really helps your assets and reduces your taxes because the government taxes you after you have spent your money on your expenses and bills instead of being taxed first and then paying your bills. So my question is, do you have a personal corporation and do you think it's a good idea? I don't. And let me tell you, this is something that can be tax avoidance or tax evasion. This is pitched is a way for an individual to be able to uh, turn income that would be taxed into untaxed income by treating expenses as something that goes against income before you pay tax. So if you have an actual real business that you're running, there are a number of legitimate business expenses for anybody running their own business that you reduce the amount of income subject to taxation because you only pay tax in a business on the net income, not the gross. If you work for an employer and you get a W-2, you're being taxed on your entire paycheck. In the case of somebody operating their own business, there are a number of expenses that are not deductible or not a reduction of um, income for a business that are not deductible for an individual, but are legitimate business expenses in a business reducing your taxation. So this is is something that is totally above board if there's a legitimate business activity, but is used by many people. It's just a gaming of the system, and it is actually illegal as tax evasion, not tax avoidance. Tax avoidance is a legal activity taking every legitimate deduction or uh, reduction in income that is permissible under the code. Evasion is when you cheat by pretending that you are operating a business and you're really not. So uh, it's only half true. Would, that be, would we call that half true? Sure. Okay, yeah. we'll go with that. Now I want to thank you so much for being with us today and know that you want the best deals on stuff that pops up every day we got that for you at clarkdeals.com and for information for your wallet you can trust go to clark.com both around the clock because the sun never sets on clark.com and clarkdeals.com and know that we are here to serve you one-on-one with free advice, information, and guidance at the Team Clark Consumer Action Center, a free service we've been offering for nearly 31 years. You can find out how to get that free advice at clark.com CAC. Have a great day.